years, I think. So the description in the page of Drupal Camp Gantt is not anymore uh, correct because it says something of one year ago, but this was before the pandemic started. So, but I wasn't sure also about the, the history of this, when I started it, when things were moving, but I have added a slide in this presentation, putting some years. So uh, I think it helps to, to understand the, a bit of the timeline. And uh, this timeline even goes uh, back in time quite a lot because uh, I'm going to, to talk about uh, history of, of secrecy, what I'm calling secrecy instead of encryption because this subject also includes steganography. That is something I want to mention uh, and encryption. So let's say secrets uh, includes these two subjects. Then uh, we will talk about symmetric versus asymmetric keys or symmetric versus asymmetric encryption. Most of you are uh, aware and use it to these concepts. Um, then this is something important that actually motivated uh, the invention of asymmetric encryption. That is the problem of transmitting secret keys in a, in a way that is not safe. So you want safeguard something that's secret by a key but how do you safeguard the transmission of the key itself? And for solving this problem is, uh, solving this problem was the motivation for asymmetric encryption. Then this also came uh, after these principles of Kirchhoff's that inaugurates uh, what we understand now by modern uh, encryption. And finally, we will do this point by point, year by year transition from asymmetric encryption that is quite recent compared to other things uh, I'm going to talk about to protected content that is this uh, project I have been working with. Then, if time allows us, I don't know how deep I can go in each of these uh, subjects, but I also would like to treat more carefully on the Drupal part, and especially how uh, we are making this to work. So I, I have here some uh, thoughts as well. Key generation, standalone encryption decryption, uh, protected content entity reference fields, direct and indirect fetcher of recipients. This is interesting. Encryption update or re-encryption. This is challenge, but we are managing to do it. Uh, automatic generation of update tasks. It's related to the previous uh, stuff. Quite difficult also, but doable. Then there are some concepts that started to appear on this like sets of recipients, uh, intuitive. Workers, that is a concept we are using for users who are able to update an encryption content. Um, errands, that are users that cause an encrypted content uh, to be expired. In other words, these are users that make create a need of updating some encrypted content. And finally, this is recipient simulation, is a way to find how to update certain types of encrypted content. When I'm saying encrypted content, uh, in reality, what's, what's happening is uh, encryption of files. But uh, one plan is to move forward and also to have encryption of text fields. But files was actually mo more difficult than text fields would have been. So we started by the more difficult and probably it will be easier to implement for text fields. Then 
this entire area of updating uh, or re-encryption of files in re-encryption uh, creates uh, two possibilities of manual updating or what we are calling lazy man's update task. This uh, not it's just an idea so far. So this is the roadmap, and I'm I'm planning to finish the presentation with uh, humble analysis of some browser's performance based on metadata collected over around 10,000 uh, encrypted files. Okay. So. Uh, uh, I wanted to start just recovering these statistics from Drupal.org download stat usage usage of Drupal Core, uh, and we see it's going down since 2016. And so what? Not because something is getting less popular. It, it, this does not mean it is getting worse. Right, so, but uh, what I see interesting here is that Drupal 7 is still relevant. And many people hope it will not remain relevant so long, but also it would be a problem if its relevance goes down together with the entire Drupal relevance. Let's see what, what's going to happen. But uh, what I'm presenting here is more about a, an idea of on how to use encryption that is actually independent from the, the from PHP, independent from Drupal. You could apply this uh, in any web project by the same principles. So it does not really matter here if it's Drupal or something else. Uh, and uh, just in the, in the same path of talking of uh, popularity against re relevance, uh, some things have lost a, a lot of popularity, but this does not mean they are not relevant. So I started my programming career professionally with Perl in a computational linguistics project uh, in the Univ University of Lisbon. And uh, that was my word at that time. And uh, when you, we, we go to Pearl Conference, conference, it's always this uh, conversation about how sad it is, Pearl is attracting less and less projects and less and less programmers. So it was always depressing to, to be around. But so what people love it using the language and if it uh, solves your problem, why not? Um, so there is an entire ecosystem of software and communities around Pro still alive today. And one, one thing, uh, when I started doing this, I, I got in contact with people from this company, Shadow Cat Systems. They were actually, they had a, a talk in Brazil, my home country, in Rio Grande do Sul, FIS, FISEL. It was an international uh, free open source software uh, conference, quite big, we have there. And they were there. And then I, I, I got to know their, their company, Shadow Cat, and I was very impressed by their motto, sufficiently advanced technology. This never went out from my mind. So, what I'm, why I'm saying all of this? Uh, it's just a, a way of looking at technology. Uh, I don't think we should be running for the latest and best solution around just because it's popular. It's not always this that will get you get your problem fixed. So. Uh, I was talking about uh, this concept of steganography. It is a, it's a bit uh, not very uh, usual to talk about this, but it is uh, includes a lot, uh, many strategies. 
most of them based on physical means of hiding a content, hiding a text, or you write it very small, uh, or uh, you write it, um, you change the writing in making for um, making people able to write it faster. This is used in the was used in justice uh, procedures, uh, but uh, also all, all these uh, ways of traveling with a hidden message in the Cold War from one one border to another. They were using a lot of steganography. So. It, the, one of the most uh, ancient registers that uh, there are about this in ancient ancient China, they were swallowing a message covering something that would not be digested, and then the person would cross some battlefield. In the other side, you would need to wait a bit, and would have the message delivered. Uh, in ancient Greece, there is a interesting register in the literature. No, nothing of this is really sure. It's just so ancient we cannot be sure. Perhaps just um, uh, tales. But in ancient Greek, there is this tale of um, shaving the hair of someone, uh, tattooing the message, waiting for the hair to, to grow. Then the person would cross the battlefield. The other side would shave the hair again and deliver the message. So this is all is steganography, because you are not changing the message, you are changing physically, um, making it uh, more difficult to be detected. This survived for a long time, in, still in the Cold War, not too long ago, and perhaps nowadays again, microfilm was being used. And very interesting, in 2013, Edward Snowden, you probably have heard about him, he left the NSA premises with uh, a memory card hidden in a Rubik's Cube that he used to play. So he was crossing the, the gates of the, the offices where the, the security was with the x-rays, but because he was playing with that, no one cared about it, he, he crossed it safely. What was the main uh, uh, technique he used, the main strategy? Steganography. So you, you would think, but how, how come this comes, this is so uh, low, low tech, but yeah, it, it's been around. What I'm going to suggest uh, afterwards is that what we are doing is still stenography. So if it's not client-side encryption, asymmetric keys, it, is, it keeps being just steganography. So by another hand, encryption uh, in general means scrambling the message uh, by synthetic syntactical means, so syntactical in the ling linguistic sense is uh, you put one component of the message after the other and the third, third one and a fourth one and the sequ sequence they, they define, this is the synthesis. So order, passe, sin, together, synthesis. Uh, and scrambling the message is to reorder that thing in a way that it loses the original cons, con, uh, content or meaning, but in a way also that you can recover the original synthesis afterwards. So there is this, uh, again, ancient technique uh, uh, pre present in the Bible that is atabash, that is uh, a replacement cipher where you get the the first letter of the alphabet and replace by the last, the second last minus one, the third last minus three, and so you just uh, follow this rule of replacement across your text. The the after the replacement, the text does not make sense anymore. 
but the it's more like a, a child uh, a, a childish uh, game it's a, a game of letters but it's uh, already contains the concept of uh, alphabet substitution then we have the Caesar cipher that was also replacing letters in the text to generate a cipher text based in an alphabet substitution. But here we do a shift. So the, the most common cipher, uh, Caesar, Caesar cipher shift key was five. So you get any word, any letter in any word, you just put, do a shift of five letters up or down and then you have your cipher text, the rewritten of the plain text. Again, this is, uh, this is perhaps is uh, uh, not so uh, childish as the Atabash because uh, you have a flexible key. So you could use five as a key, six as a key and so on uh, until the size of the alphabet because otherwise you start getting the letters back to the original position. Uh, but still very easy to decipher by uh, statistical, statistical analysis because the languages, they have this property of having some letters being more common than others. So English has a e, letter E is a lot common. So you get the cipher text you classify each uh, occurrence of, of letter in the cipher text by the amount of times it appeared in the, in the text, and you start to guess which letter was that. So if you know the language, you know what are the more, most common letters in that language, and then you get the cipher text, you find what are the most common letters in the cipher text, and you can guess. And once you guess one or two letters, you can easily guess the others. So this uh, method of guessing encryption by statistical analysis was uh, created by the Arabic uh, civilization. Then in 1553, we had in, in Venetian a way of uh, doing uh, uh, using alphabet replacement, but using more than one alphabet. And then you would have bigger keys. Uh, it's more, more of the same. It gets more complex and then you, it's required a bigger amount of text to be able to decrypt it, to break the encryption, but it's still uh, easily breakable. Uh, and uh, there is uh, this uh, figure I have here, uh, the Cital. This was a Greek device, ancient Greek device for encryption. This is very interesting and uh, very little explored. Uh, uh, this is, is, you have that stick, it has some sides. It could have three sides. And then you you write your, you roll it if with this piece of leather, and then you write uh, along the stick. So when you remove the leather from the stick, the sequence they have are this one, the sequence that was going around, but the text what is jumping from many letters to many letters. I don't know if this is clear, but for example, if I have here the word, this is the first word of my text, this is the first line of my text, second line of my text, third line of my text, and so on. It's a, it, it, this becomes a table. But the, when you get out the letter from the stick, if you don't know what is the diameter of the stick, you don't, you, you, it's very difficult to guess the message. So in this uh, method, the diameter of the stick is the key. So how many sides it has. Uh, this, uh, when I came with, around with this thing, I, I was very amazed by how simple it is. 
and also also how complex it becomes when you try to define it mathematically. So I spent a couple of days, not to say weeks or months, playing with this thing, and I came with a mathematical description that I think it, it is the first. This was sleeping, and I did not find no other mathematical description as the one I found. And then I, I was uh, lucky enough to publish it in the online encyclopedia of interview sequences. This, uh, this I don't know if you, if you are uh, all right. Uh, do someone have visited it? No? Oh, this is an amazing uh, mathematical reference book, let's say, because uh, not only from, for mathematics, it's for science in general. It's like this. Any scientific field that generates a sequence of integer numbers uh, can be represented in this encyclopedia. So, yeah, the, the entire science is there. And then uh, I was exploring uh, how many times I had to encrypt something with the Cital until the cipher text becomes again the original plain text. And then this, this number of times you have to re-encrypt with the Citali, together with uh, different sizes of Citalis, gives a sequence of integer numbers. And then I uh, looked for the sequence in the online encyclopedia of integer sequence, it not, was not there. And when you try this, the, the encyclopedia offers you uh, the possibility of proposing it. And then there is a big process of revisioning and formatting the mathematical description you give to that, to that format. Okay, but this is uh, uh, another story. Uh, now, we were uh, talking before, so uh, symmetric encryption has this uh, problem of you have the, a key that does the encryption and does the decryption. So you have to send the message, but the message without the key is useless. So the message is protected by the key, but what protected the key? Nothing. So uh, you have to trust the channel, so you can send the message via a uh, unprotected channel, and you send the key yourself. <laughs> but this, this uh, imposes a lot of uh, problems uh, of logistics. So, uh, this is a big limitation for the strategy of using a symmetric key. In 1883, there was this uh, uh, Dutch uh, linguist working in France. He came up with uh, some proposals of what should make better encryption. And he was actually making fun of the military um, approaches to this problem at the time. So he came with these uh, principles, these guidelines that are today considered uh, guidelines for modern encryption. So uh, this is uh, some translation of someone from the original text that is in French. I have read the, the original text, but I, I just copied this translation from someone. So it Item number one, the system must be practically, if not mathematically, undecipherable. This uh, undecipherable, not really. It's just a matter of having a bigger key it takes more time to find it. So every key is at a certain moment decipherable if you have enough speed and time to do it. But practically, yes, because if, if we found that for today's technology, I, I will spend 100 years for finding a key, it could be, could be considered good enough. Uh, this uh, item number two, it must not be required to be secret. The, this is very interesting. The encryption schema should not be secret. The keys should be secret. At least one key should be, this is perhaps one of the most important, uh, important principles here. It must not be required to be secret. 
and it must be able to fall into the hands of the enemy without inconvenience. So, this is what, which bell it hangs in our heads, free and open source software. Because if we do an uh, encryption schema that we are confident enough to make it public, it means it fulfills this uh, principle number two. Uh, its key must be communicable and retainable without the help of read, write, written notes and changeable or modifiable at the will of the correspondence. So the first part, uh, without the help of written notes, this is important because uh, a, a key, a password, a passphrase that you can remember uh, in your head uh, can uh, will be, it's less safe because it's not very big, but it avoids you from writing it down and writing it down is a security problem. So uh, this is one principle that uh, I was following in this uh, work and kind of is achieve, achieved. We were able to do that. Uh, uh, I'll show it later because you, you, can, you can have public and private key that are big, uh, but you can have uh, in, for asymmetric encryption. And then you can do symmetric encryption of the private key. So this is kind of uh, a way of uh, shortening it. Makes it less safe compared to a bigger key? Yes, it makes, but avoids the users from having to write it down. Um, it must be applicable to telegraphic correspondence at his time, so today's time, cell phone, I want to be able to encrypt and decrypt with my phone. Um, five, apparatus and documents must be portable and its usage and function, function must not require the concourse of several people. This is not the standard way that is been uh, happening not too long ago because uh, it was still being sold uh, 10 years ago, perhaps 20 years ago. Machine, encryption machines that were, was being sold by a, a company in Switzerland to several governments. So <laughs> it's an entire machine, like it was the Enigma machine from the Germans. This is, uh, Switzerland company, company in Switzerland was doing also machines specialized for encryption. Well, this brings a lot of problem and not uh, fulfills these principles of cache-offs. And finally, uh, it's necessary given the sequences that command uh, its application that the system be easy to use, requiring neither mental strain nor the knowledge of, of a long series of rules to observe. Quite intuitive, this principle, and for us, it translates in good user experience. So it's interesting how these principles are uh, still appealing for our today experience on web development. Now, let's move forward in this uh, his brief history of secrets that is becoming quite big. Uh, let me see what time it is. So there, in 1976, uh, Diff and Hellman, they, they invented the concept of uh, asymmetric key. Um, and th there are some uh, met metaphors uh, uh, used for describing it, but uh, I think most of us are uh, familiar with this. So uh, we have, uh, th this is interesting. Uh, th uh, the relation between the symmetric and the asymmetric key is given by a mathematical function that cannot be easily reversed. So this was found when the concept was invented, they did not have the mathematical function. So they, they had the idea of, oh, okay, we should be able to have a not easy to reverse mathematical function that would be, would give us a public key that is connected to the to the private key, but I cannot derive the private key from the public key. So this was finally discovered 
just one year afterwards. So the proposal was in 76, and SA came to exist in 77. Um, this is uh, based, based in prime numbers and in the difficult of finding the factors of prime numbers. Oh, uh, we, we are very short in time and very, very uh, in the beginning of the presentations. <laughs> it's a disaster. Well, well, what should I do? In other places, I, I have been talking about this, uh, uh, not the same presentation, nev I never repeat the presentation, but this subject, I have been repeating it. And sometimes I was able to do a live demonstration. I will not do it now. I don't have an uh, environment ready for that. So let's move forward. Uh, now, this, uh, I cannot move forward before talking about OpenPGP.js. So, uh, you had in 77 RSA using a big prime numbers. And the, the idea is, uh, the mathematics is a, is a bit complex, but the basic is, uh, idea is very simple. Uh, uh, you understand. You have uh, two numbers, and you multiply one by the other, and you get a product. Then, if from the product, you want to find back which were the two numbers multiplied. If these numbers are big, and if the two numbers multiplied are prime numbers, this is very hard to do, because you have to scan the entire set of numbers possible for finding those two numbers. So it's a brute force in devil, and bigger is the number, bigger is the universe of numbers you have to test against. So that's it. Uh, this is based in the, this amazing fact of numbers that is, it's no one knows how to predict the next prime number. This is really amazing because there is even a prize for someone who finds, who proves this, because we cannot predict uh, the next prime number, but we cannot be sure that uh, the next prime number is not predictable. So it's, it's, we, are, we are in the shadows in this area. And it's interesting because the prime numbers uh, are a very basic concept that uh, are, they are with us since the ancient Greeks. And it's, it's still a mystery. So RSA is be based in this mystery. The day someone finds a solution for this mystery, SA is gone. Uh, then uh, uh, Phil Zimmerman wrote, uh, took these concepts, these papers, these academic papers, and turned it into software. And it was the, the beginning of PGP, 1991, written in C. Then he had a lot of troubles with the Justice United States because it was considered a weapon. It was considered a military-grade weapon, and he wa was not allowed to use it. So he was even in prison because of that. But then the law changed, and uh, it came to be open, uh, open PGP. Uh, ah, yeah. Then, because of facing so many troubles with the law, uh, he understood that it would flourish better if it was turned into a standard. And so it came to be the Open PGP as a standard in the IETF in 1997. Uh, and after that, we have in 1999 a new implementation for this. So every Unix, Linux system was able to run, also written in C. And finally, we had in 2011 the translation of this to JavaScript with the OpenPGP.js. That was later in 2014, uh, the founding piece of ProtonMail. 
And finally, this is where I put myself in this history. In 2019, we created this model in Drupal that is basically a wrapper for OpenPGP.js. Okay, we have not five, 15 minutes now. Uh, I'm going to show some screenshots, right? Uh, so now talking about protected content, how it works and how it uses OpenPGP.js. So uh, the user first has to create, uh, allow the browser to create his uh, encryption keys. And the, 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 it will be created a public key and a private key. All of this happens in, in JavaScript in the browser. Before anything is submitted, uh, the private key is encrypted symmetrically by this password the user is typing. This is a zero proof knowledge schema. In other words, no one can recover that password. Uh, the system administrator cannot recover that password. We cannot do, it's just impossible. The only person who knows the password is the user who is typing it. And the password is not going to be submitted. This is a form, but it will not submit those fields. What is submitted to Drupal is the encrypted version of the private key. So uh, after this, uh, if someone has created his encryption keys and I want to encrypt something to that person, I don't, uh, the, the sender does not need to have encryption keys, just the receiver, the recipient has, needs to have encryption keys. And what happens, um, the public key is downloaded when I try to add some file to someone. Uh, the public key of this someone is downloaded and the, my file is encrypted against that public key. And then everything that comes afterwards is just PGP. Uh, now, this is the simple screenshots of, uh, of uh, selecting a file, file letting it to be encrypted, and saving it is, means saving the ciphertext. So again, nothing of the original file besides the, the file name and some metadata, a size of the file, goes to the server. It goes only the ciphertext that really uh, contains, kind of contains the content. Uh, then Drupal will generate an ID, ID for that entity, and the ID can be used for retrieving, for the recipient to decrypt it. So this is what gets into the database, a label with the file name, some meta information, and then this is going to be linked to some way of storage. This is, I'm not going to touch this too much, but the model has a sub-model of that called proc storage that allows you to choose several options of storage. So you can store, store it in the database or outside the database in the file system or FTP, whatever is, uh, string wrapper you want to use. Uh, then when the, the recipient wants to decrypt it, the recipient just is asked the same uh, password he used when creating his uh, keys. If the user forgot the password and he was the only recipient of that content, the content is lost. This is a pitfall. Uh, we cannot recover at all. But in some scenarios, when you have several recipients receiving something, and one of those recipients has changed his encryption key or forgot because of forgotten or because he wanted to change. So that one user lost access to that file. But if I have other users who still can, are able to decrypt that file, then we came with this idea of re-encryption. So we, we made uh, this operation of updating an encryption file that means decrypting and encrypting it again. So even if, if someone loses the access, if someone still has access, it's not lost because that person is just, it's like doing uh, downloading, decrypting, and encrypting again, but Drupal helps this, this to happen, all, all, all of it in a single uh, button. 
<coughs> and this is uh, still in the description. Then the, uh, I, I was, uh, we were here uh, say, talking about uh, uh, a sender choosing a recipient uh, one by one or one to many, but this being done manually. We came with a way of doing this selection of recipients automatically as well. That is a submodel called a uh, proc reference field, proc heat field, uh, where you can define a view that's going to select certain users based on certain criteria. There, and those users will become the recipients of your encryption. Uh, well, uh, we don't have too much time actually. And this is the moment of getting to the, my last slide, last slides. Um, this is, I, I was coming with this in the last few days. Uh, this is an analysis of, uh, of around 10,000 encryptions with different sizes of files in different browsers. The browsers here are just numbers, uh, but the, these numbers with the colors here, they represent u different user agents. And uh, this was uh, good results to see. Uh, the, the, the distribution is logarithmic. This is why we have this curve at the end. But if it's linear, the, the increase, the, the loss of speed by increasing the size is very small. So it, it, we can confidently do this kind of encryption with files up to 500 megabytes with no problem happens like this. It's very efficient. So, uh, then uh, I wanted to, to look deeper in this and find out which are, were, was the best browser, which was the worst browser. But this is uh, hard to do. You need to be a specialist on statistics for doing this properly. But I, I, I tried my best and I came out with this table where uh, based in uh, the number of encryptions evaluated in the last column, these encryptions evaluated here, uh, we came out with these uh, scores for each browser. And it seems that at least in the universe of this project, 10,000 uh, encrypted files, that, that's not so little. Uh, we came with Chrome 8.5 in Windows 10 being the fastest browser. And Chrome 8.8 in Windows 10 being the, slow, the slower. Um, this is, yeah, I, I thought it would be more uh, interesting the results because, but uh, many versions of Chrome being used and it's interesting that an uh, older version, 8.5, is faster than 9.7, that is in the fourth position. These are uh, a rank uh, made on the most used browsers. But uh, if I, when I got the older browsers, and this is not a fair competition, because you are going to compare browsers that encrypt just a, a handful of files against browsers that encrypted a lot, but even though it's some information and in this overall competition, the, the, the best was Chrome 94, Windows 10, and the worst, Chrome 87 in Linux, probably a test done by myself, but just two, two files encrypted very slowly at that moment. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your patience. Any question? So, got a question on on all this crypto cryptography. Uh, does this also play well with things like JWT and HMAC uh, secrets? Yeah, this is hashing, right? Yeah, hashing and and transversing in there. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate more? Oh yeah, we use uh, JWT within. Um, Jitsi meet in order to get the session and the avatar and all the stuff in place. And then when you hit uh, Microsoft Teams, they add HMAC as uh, their crypto algorithm on top of there. And I'm just 
curious on, on how this plays together. So maybe this could be for a central hub replacing something like a, a HashiCorp vault or something like that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready for answer to this, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what I have seen is these goals, these hashing schemas go with uh, authentication. Mm -hmm. In, in, but this is not really uh, a symmetric uh, that goes to the secrecy. So, and this is, uh, the, the word secrecy comes together with privacy, but it's a bit weird because privacy seems to be a, privacy is the secret for the poor, right? Secrets, no, secrets is the serious stuff for the important person. And this is misleading, in my opinion. I think uh, we should. Uh, so, some people ask, but w why, why doing this? And then uh, perhaps the answer is, how come we are not doing this? Because uh, this kind of uh, approach makes the content belonging to the owner of the content, to the owner, the author, and the recipients, and only them. So I am the, the system owner, I am the system administrator. I should not be addressed to something that was not addressed to me. And this is not happening at all. So we are just forgetting about this possibility. Uh, this is what put uh, people in prison in the 70s. And then now we are just uh, sleeping over it, not using the, the possibility of the technology. Okay. So, so, so there might be an opportunity there, uh, since this tokens hashing is fixed by one uh, authentication provider. So if the authentication provider is federating with other entity providers, then this could come to some kind of a... No, okay, cool. So, uh, understand you uh, encrypt files, right? Yeah. Uh, what about image styles? So, Sorry, what about? Image styles. In yeah. Drupal, you can use image styles, like cropping your ah. image and so on. And if I do that, will the copy be also encrypted? Ah, you mean... I have a, ah, interesting. For example, if, uh, because the way it's working now, it's like, it works as attachments. Mm -hmm. So it's a file someone uploads, attaching it to some, for example, a private message and attachment. And then someone, the recipient of the private message gets it, decrypt the attachment. So it's not really incorporating the, the image, for example, if it's an image, into the the layout of the project of the website but it could be done mm -hmm. it could be done i don't know how perhaps you help me yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> okay so we saw that it's fast to decrypt um and we are talking about the uh, actually, uh, the statistics I'm showing is not the decryption statistics. These I don't have. It's the encryption statistics. Okay. Is the how long it took to encrypt? To encrypt. Okay. Uh, so getting the the image style um, context. Uh, in the beginning of the talk, you said that it might be that later on working with content. Yes, uh, text, text fields. Text. This yes. is the next step. Yeah. Um, so, um, I imagine that for now, uh, with the, the current state, uh, if we had to decrypt first to load the page, it would be something, in your opinion right now, that it would make it um, unusual, unusual? No, I think it would be very fast and it could work, mm -hmm. I think. I, I don't have, I did not have tested this, but by my day by day experience on doing this, it would work, I think. 
so we could in the in the extreme scenario we could have uh, every image in a template encrypted for a certain user and only for him and even we could uh, this is a bit crazy thinking about that the layout is a secret and also the metadata that defines the style of that image could also be encrypted and then once both are decrypted they can put be put together i think it would work i have another question uh, the project the distribution that i'm working on uh, will need that thing um, we have the situation which is um, i have um, uh, research data that is private then i'll have to encrypt uh, it it's but it's the same area of um, med medicine they have uh, data from patients they don't want to make it very easily to find exactly but then we have a problem uh, because it's a um, platform for curation of content and for researchers to work with um, primary data that will become secondary data later on by analysis and things uh, we must be able to search mm -hmm. so now we have a problem Proton Mail made a solution to this, but I don't really know how. But um, but they 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 they, they, they have they do client side encryption of emails, and they have these journalists that receive hundreds of documents. They need to search over it. One solution is uh, first thing that comes to my mind is a simple PWA application within your your project that is going to index the content just decrypted so you can use local storage for that and running js scripts for doing the indexation the SQL queries and uh, encrypted. Okay, I think uh, we are done. It's time. Thank you very much for your patience and your presence. <laughs>